thank all our panelists for agreeing to come and share their thoughts on, uh, on this topic. And I'm going to run through a short introduction for everyone. Um, you have the bios in your packs, I believe, but let me start by introducing Nana. So Nana is the CEO of Qualys Group, which comprises five companies, uh, two of which are Wonder World Estates and Petronia City Development. He has been a successful developer in the Ghanaian real estate space for over 15 years and has developed over 500 residential and retail units. In the wake of Africa's lack of industrial and manufacturing platforms, Nana recognized the capacity of Takoradi to be the center of economic and social activity that would emerge once exploration activities in the oil and gas space began in Ghana. So the Petronia City development was born as a 2,000 acre project planned as a fully integrated business hub for West Africa's oil, gas, and mining industries. Chinwe is head of business development at Rendeva, which is Africa's leading urban developer with 30,000 acres of land or development in Kenya, Ghana, Nigeria, Zambia, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. She has over 20 years of experience in strategic advisory, asset management and portfolio rationalization transactions across various property sectors. She spent 14 years with Jones Lang LaSalle, where she established the Africa office in Nigeria. She also established the French International Desk in Paris, where she served global Fortune 500 corporates. And also importantly, she worked on PPP housing privatization initiatives when she was in the United States. Chinwe sits on the Women in Housing Sector Initiative Board and is also a guest lecturer at the Lagos Business School. Tola is an investment banker and has had various roles within corporate and investment banking with specializations in real estate finance and project and structured finance. He has over 15 years of in-country and regional work experience, including Nigeria, Ghana, and Cote d'Ivoire spanning various asset classes, and has transacted an estimated portfolio size of about $1.5 billion within the real estate sector. He's also been actively involved in a number of real estate industry advocacy committees to engage regulators to unlock constraints to the catalyzation of growth and development of real estate investment trusts. And finally, Mustafa. Mustafa owns and manages TF Africa Global. And that company is geared towards the delivery of efficient and affordable homes across Africa. He has 28 years of experience delivering projects throughout Africa, throughout West Africa, and is a household name in the Gambia and in Nigeria. So thanks again. Um, I think we will start with, we'll start with you, Nana. So, Petronia City is an ambitious large-scale city development. Can you talk us through some of the challenges you faced in launching the project and how you have overcome them? Thank you very much, Laurie. So I'm um, talking of the challenges one can face when they want to build a city. I'm sure that will be a lot if I have to go through all that. But one of the first things that I think venturing such projects would be acquisition. Acquisition is key in Africa. We haven't studied about our land policies, how to acquire this land of 2,000 acres. That could be 65 families. That could be 12 different chiefs facing the commission and facing the land registration. So once you are able to have these things as ownership of the land, that is what actually gives you the capacity and the ability to want to develop a city. And then you move to the other um, surfaces where the government is involved, talking about permit, EPA permit for 2,000 
acre land, it's such a difficult thing to come by. It's not just for an acre or for a plot. So you have to work on the permit. Then you, after paying for the land and the permit, you have to work on something called crop compensation. You have to pay for every single crop on the land before you become a full owner. And then after that, you have to put a bunch of architects and engineers worldwide, locally, internationally, bring them together to be able to put a whole city plan scape. Now, people that might want to put their time in for such developments are not people who are after money. These are people who truly want to change their generation, truly want to add value to their people's life in their country, because you have to go through these processes before you can even put a block on the land when you want to build a city. And these are some of the challenges. And I hope the other people that will come after me to do build cities will have the patience, will have the strength, and would be able to focus on getting this done. But it's not easy. Once it's done, a million step gets moved forward. Thank you, Nana. Thank you. Thank you. And, and I think on that note, uh, Chinwe, I'll turn to you. Um, so, Nana mentioned a few things with respect to ownership, title, some of the bureaucracy, and all the work you need to do to build a city in Africa. Now, Rendeva has been at the forefront of de-risking real estate investment in Africa and allowing international and domestic capital to access opportunities across the continent. So, what are, what are some of the critical lessons that Rendeva has learned from both the public and private sectors in order to actually enable this investment? Sure, thank you very much for the question, Landre. I think in terms of lessons learned, all of that ties into the overall strategy that you incorporate when facing these type of projects, like Nana mentioned. I think you have to have the visionary, you have to be a visionary and wear it all and taking a very, very long-term horizon. And I think that's what has really worked to the benefit of Rendeavor. Majority of the projects that you do see now that are coming to fruition are actually projects that were in the works 10, 15 years. What really transpired for Rendeavor was behind a, a, a deal that was done in Kenya, the tattoo project that, that resulted in coffee land being owned. And the founders had the vision to say, wow, this is an opportunity to go into land banking. Let's look at other African countries where we can do a similar type of strategy. And that's what began what ultimately led to Endeavor, was the quiet acquisition of these tracts of land over a duration of, as I said, 10, 15 years. And the Endeavor strategy is quite straightforward. We are aware of the challenges that do exist in terms of financing and in terms of use, utilizing debt. So right off the bat, the strategy has always to focus on equity and ensure there's no debt. Now to do that, it's taking a long-term horizon, getting in there before the economy or the city grows to that level, and then acquiring the large tracts, because that's where you can actually be able to acquire the large tracts of land. Yeah. And because there's limited interest, then you do have government or part, other partners who have a similar vision, they'll be more than willing to support you because they see that you have, um, you are able to mobilize financing teams and all that is needed to bring such a vision to reality. Mm -hmm. And so because of that long-term vision, it's what has enabled us to acquire these properties um, over time um, in different parts and jurisdictions in, in, in Africa, in partnership both with government and private individuals, and acquired their debt, allowing us to maintain that debt-free status, so that by the time the economy changes or the timing is right, because by ensuring that you're able to acquire these early, you now have the flexibility to mobilize when the market dynamics is suitable. And once that market dynamic is suitable, then we get in and mobilize on site. And also because we have a diversity in terms of the types of land we have across Africa, then it also allows us to be responsive depending on where the market is. So if a market is successful, the environment is right, urbanization is occurring, political goodwill is there, then we come in while waiting for other markets where such a thing may not be existing or all the elements required to make it ideal to get into the, mar to get into the site. 
is non-existent, then we are able to do so because we have a diversity in terms of our portfolio. Okay. Thanks, thanks, Chinwei. So I'm going to move to you, Paula. And we've heard Nana and Chinwei talk about the need for long-term patient capital. Um, and, and I think, you know, we all know that West Africa or Africa as a whole is a unique investment environment. So what, I mean, you're, you're a banker. You, you have to look at projects all day long. I mean, what, when you've seen these uh, proposals or you're putting funding proposals together, what kind of capital do you think is needed for projects on this scale? And are there alternative sources to what is currently available? Um, thank you very much, Larry. I, um, I, mean, I think one needs to dimension it in, in you know, there are different buckets of projects. Um, um, I mean, the, you can classify real estate asset classes to say there are two key types, um, built to sell property and then built to let. Um, so depending on, on, on what um, project dynamics that you're looking at will determine the kind of capital structure that, that, that should go there, there and so. But I mean, speaking directly to, seems this conversation is tweaking towards more housing and um, urban city the, the, the projects. So if one wants to think about those kind of projects, typically, um, because there's a level of in infrastructure uh, development that needs to go into that into that city, then you're not able to finance it from a banking point of view. Bank, banking finance is typically focused on cash flows, right? So, um, and, and, and I think Chinwe was, was right in saying that um, the, 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 the companies would acquire the assets first and ensure that the level of infrastructure that, that goes in and, and, you know, you play that with, with equity capital whilst um, tying your cash flows and development to such a time when you're able to then um, develop assets or housing that um, can then be sold and you, re and you then release um, cash flows. Uh, you know, so that's, that's, that's the broad metrics there. Um, for development, there are different capital stacks. So um, equity on one hand, mass debt finance on the other hand, and then debt capital. And I think for projects in, um, in in, in um, Africa, there seems to be more um, more emphasis on debt, but um, you know you, you set up a project poorly when when and, and create problems for it later on when you when you have debt and you don't have the cash flow to to then back it up. So it's important um, to 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 have uh, which you've pointed out innovative um, long-term capital structure focus on the type of project, looking at the cash flows and, and ensuring that at the end, you know, you're able to ensure that equity investors are able to be paid out, make the right right returns, return capital or debt finance back to to, to whoever as 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 um, as, as for that. So that, you know so that basically, you know should 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 then um, give you a scope of of, of how you funding your your projects, and then the capital stack that that that, that needs to be focused and um, provided to provide funding to that particular project. Um, so as find it once again between build to let properties and then build to sell um, property types. Okay, thank you, Tola. So moving to Mustafa. So moving away from this uh, from the financing angle. Thank you. Your your firm has this, an ambitious. Uh, stated goal of building one million homes within 20 years across Africa. And you spent 28 years doing this. Um, what do you think needs to happen? What do you think needs to happen for you to achieve this objective? How are you going to do it? Well, thank you. Um, um, actually, yes, my firm is about 28 years old, as Tap Africa Global. But um, uh, this vision came about last year. Um, so it's 20 years vision starting from last year. And um, reason being that um, uh, 
it's an opportunity. We've seen, as what previous speakers said, that um, um, urbanization in Africa is, is, is rapidly growing, mm -hmm. and therefore there is a demand and there's an opportunity. So uh, one of, there are huge challenges in mass housing development because to achieve um, uh, a million homes over 20 years means that you need to develop about 50,000 units every year, which is still a huge number. So uh, huge challenges, but one of our major strategies is to make sure that whatever we do, we partner with states and governments. Okay. And we have succeeded in doing so in Nigeria, um, um, almost completing um, a development in, in Port Harcourt of about 1,100 homes. So we've done it in the Niger Delta. I mean, Gambian and, and, and you know, doing this in the Niger De Delta was a huge challenge, but we, we overcome the challenges. Recently, we've just signed with the Akwa Ibom State Government to develop uh, 160 hectare of, again, affordable homes. So uh, in order for this to happen, I mean, there are a lot of challenges that you will face. There's no doubt about it. Okay. Um, and this goes across all the African countries. Um, uh, but some are actually better than others. Um, funnily enough, when I talk about Nigeria, people think I'm Nigerian because, I mean, I find doing business in Nigeria much more easier than some of these African countries uh, for different reasons. Okay. I mean, size, language barrier, you know, uh, bureaucracy, so many things. Mm -hmm. So uh, in order for this to happen, some of the things that needs to be done is one, one of the major challenges that I find is political continuity. Because we all know that, you know, today in this world, everybody calls out for uh, democracy in our government. So every government sits there for four years. A sitting government for four years, actually in reality, is not four years. It's one year for him to understand what he wants to do, two years probably to be active, and then probably one year preparing for the next elections. And then whenever they come, they want to go back on all the agreements that we were signed, you know, uh, before them. Mm -hmm. so, so that's one of the major challenges. So that needs to be addressed. That, you know, this kind of development takes ages for it to be done. So therefore, there needs to be continuity, you know, at the political level. And um, uh, that can be done by, one, making sure that you choose the right partners. I mean, that's one thing that I've learned also. I mean, coming into Nigeria, I mean, choosing the right partners who understand the ground. Mm -hmm. um, finance is always a challenge everywhere, but um, um, again, um, I think banks and financial institutions are more receptive to financing to the, um, the housing sector than before. Mm -hmm. So we've, we've seen an improvement. There is a demand. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, there's a demand for, for, for affordable housing. Again, I'll give an example. In the Gambia, we've succeeded to convince free banks to be issuing out mortgages now, affordable mortgages, at almost a single digit rate. So this is an improvement. I think that um, housing in general is being seen as banking about 25, 30 years ago. If we all look back at one, banking and also telco, nobody would put money in these sectors about 30 years ago. It was when the Nigerian banks came up, like the GTs and others, mm -hmm. that today people have seen, you know, major, major, major returns on banking, and um, this sector has changed. Same thing with telco. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. just think back about 30 years ago. I mean, to have a phone, what you need to do just to call on the phone. Today, your house helps have access to three mobile phones. You know, there's no, no landlines anymore. So for me, I think there's a huge opportunity in housing. Everybody needs a roof over his head. And until those of us who are into mass housing come up with the answers to make housing affordable, it's a major, major opportunity waiting to be grabbed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mustafa. Um, so I think we're going to come back to, to housing more specifically. Uh, but Nana, you, you, you started off uh, building 30 to 40 units of uh, residential, I think I read somewhere, um, annually. And then you decided to build an entire city. So I want to, to understand how you sized up the opportunity and how you measured the risk. So what, what made you go for it? 
Well, first of all, I started with two houses on one plot. Then it moved to eight, 12, 16, and then 32. Today, my company can boldly say that we produce maybe 180 homes in two years. But for me, it's not such an achievement because I can still see, like, see a gap that needs to be bridged. And hence, that's what maybe you touch basis on some of these opportunities that is coming across Africa in development. Africa hasn't been developed in the past 200 years to its capacity. And we, the developers, private sectors, government, and the people even in the country as citizens, haven't actually sat back and asked yourself the question, why are we not moving so fast? Why is every other country being developed? They also haven't looked at other countries that has been developed, such as Dubai and Singapore. These are the two countries that has been developed in one century. So you're talking between 60 to 40 years. It's, it's happened in our lifetime. And when you go after the things that they did to develop their countries, for me to want to move from building 150 homes to go into a city, it's not because I just want to increase my numbers. It's because I want to build a country. It's because I want to build a nation. I looked at those people and what were the things that they did? One of the major things that these countries did was that they introduced industrialization which Africans have been lacking for a very long time. Now, when I say industrialization, I live in a country where I import everything to finish my houses. It takes me three months for them to manufacture it. Then after, it takes me another month for them to ship it. Then after it gets here, it takes me 50% of the value that I invested in Europe to get it out and send it to the site before I put it on the building. So even if I say I'm going to build 150 homes, to go through this process, and we know that we have deficits, deficits of 45 million homes in Africa, that is going to take us a thousand years if we don't start to build our own industrial platforms. The industrial platforms that is going to stop us from having to go all the way to Europe and buy a door and buy a lock and buy this and come back home and fit it. When we can just bring the same people here to do the same thing. In fact, one of the people here, Alessandro, who is my very good friend, and he's, he owns Chateau, and I met him the first time I met him. Yes, we did our business and we spent close to a million, but I said to him, Alessandro, this is not what I want to be doing. I don't want to be buying things from you from Europe. I want to bring you to Africa with me and sit on my industrial platform. I want to invest with you so we can supply African countries for these things. They can get it in eight days. They can get it in 10 days. The reason why Europe is developing so fast is because when you want a door, the next day is at your doorstep. Anything you want, the next day is at your doorstep. So we Africans, we have to wait for three months to get a door to our doorstep. And we want to develop our country without facing these issues. We really need to address these issues. We Africans, and I don't blame the government, and I don't blame the citizens. I don't blame myself because I don't believe in excuses, but I believe in doing. This needs to be done. We need to convince our partners, our suppliers, our manufacturers who we're dealing with to come to Africa with us. They have to sit on our industrial platforms. We need to find ways to build energy. The rate of energy in Africa is 13%. How are we going to build it? We need it to go to 50%. We need to invest in energy so industrialization can create room for pioneering. Now we're talking about mass housing. I've already done the numbers, and I did it so well that, you know, JLL is one of the people that I work with and other companies but when I sat behind my own closed doors and decided to do these numbers for affordable housing, you are building a home for someone for 20000 calling affordable that they will never get the money for you. A million people in one country cannot afford to give you $20,000 because they have the minimum wage, a minimum wage that finishes before the end of the month. How are they going to pay their mortgage? We have a problem, even the financial systems, because for me to have grown this far, in my business is because I didn't have to think in the beginning that I needed the bank to support me to grow. I realized that they just couldn't do it. I didn't have to think that I needed the government to support me to grow. I just realized that they couldn't do it. If they haven't done it for the country, how are they going to do it for me? I feel like we Africans are the future, that we are going to develop our own country by thinking and having a positive way of thinking, bringing people from outside 
to join us to develop our country because the history of every country in this world that has been developed brought people from outside. Even Dubai, they brought the Pakistanis, they brought different people to work, to build Dubai. And then they had the biggest industrial platform, which is Shadra. You can confirm yourself. Today, it's the biggest industrial uh, free zone platform in the world. They had to build their own glasses, manufacture their own glasses, manufacture their own alukubon, and it was two minutes drive away from Dubai. You wonder why those buildings were springing up so fast. Without these things, I think we have an issue. And I couldn't have any stage to address some of this. It might sound a little bit political, it might sound a little bit governmental, a little bit business, but it's the truth that until we start to have this positive mind of developing our nation, our people, and thinking deep down the solution of the problem, which is the root of what is stopping our development, Africans' development still will be stagnant. And I think it's our time. The world is looking at us. We are the last continent to be developed. And we're going into the golden age. I believe that we all stand a great opportunity with the people who have come from outside, the people internal, people around, people come from other places in this con on this continent. We all stand a great chance to build opportunities out of this and build our country and build our nation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Donald. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, Chinwe, um, you have to follow that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, I mean, Nana talks about the lack of infrastructure. I mean, many cities have a deficit in terms of transport infrastructure and energy infrastructure. And Rendezvous has, has been building um, its cities, has designed its cities to address some of these things. But tell us, what, how has Rendezvous tried to make um, its development attractive for investors, for other developers, and uh, occupiers? OK. Sure. Um, I think it's. I think it's similar to what Nana is pointing out too. And I think, you know, you know I applaud Nana for his passion. Um, what he has said and what you also said when you spoke earlier is that there are really opportunities that exist in Africa. Given that it's a low playing field, it's vast, given the numbers and given the challenges that exist, it's a matter of having the mindset of seeing the challenges as opportunities. And I think that's where Rendeva comes in in seeing infrastructure that other emerged countries take for granted as a true opportunity and a differentiator. And that's what we hone in. And so our strategy, which I would say for emerging countries, may, for emerged countries may seem quite simplistic, actually ends up being a major differentiator in, in Africa and the places that we play in. Especially when you tack on top of that, that we're going into areas that are not developed, that are 10 years before the development catches up, you can only imagine some of these areas are swamp. Some of it is actually just swampland. There are no major roads, there's no electricity, there's nothing being produced there. And we open it up and establish a development that brings the city or brings urbanization there. So it's a major um, result at the end. Now to achieve that, our differentiator has been infrastructure because infrastructure is a major, major, major issue in our countries. Thanks, to, as you've pointed out rightfully in your speech, urbanization, rapid urbanization is the reality of Africa and of our nations. And the cities that currently exist were not designed for the urbanization that exists currently. Lagos, where I currently live, is 20 million plus people. In fact, I'm, more, I'm sure it's more than that. But let's just say 20 million. The city was not designed for 20 million. And as a result, the challenges you see when you go through Lagos is as a result of um, a lack of poor planning and planning with a vision for the long-term growth of the city. So what Rendeva does is take advantage of or see that challenge as an opportunity to deliver such an infrastructure solution that allows for growth and expansion of a city in a new location or a sub-city outside. And that's what we do. So we come in, we put in all the infrastructure from land, I mean, we already have the land, 
So we're putting up front a level of infrastructure for electricity, water, sewage, um, 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 trash collection, the works. And we do it, in a, we come up with a modular solution that allows for expansion to take place. Phase one, we put in the infrastructure, then we start selling, and as we sell, we utilize the income from that to then do phase two, phase three. And it's designed in such a way that it allows for the city to grow and for the infrastructure to expand as the city grows. But in addition to that, and this is a lesson learned for other cities that we've seen, where you've put in the infrastructure, you provide the land, you sell, and you remove your hands. In 10, one, unfortunately for our countries, one of the things that is seriously lacking is management, managing uh, property management, facilities management. It's why you would see beautiful buildings that come up, and in five, 10 years, they end up um, coming, running down to class B. So our vision is recognizing that as a situation. It's either you're going to come in and say, you're gonna be the facilities managers and come up with a facility management solution, or what Boneva has done is we are going to manage the infrastructure. And we manage the infrastructure into perpetuity, meaning investors, as a result, it becomes a win-win, especially for investors that are in there for the long term. Manufacturing companies, companies that are doing warehousing, companies that are coming into the country, similar to what Nana had said, are here for the long term. Well, if you're here for the long haul, your infrastructure, all of that needs to be supported. Our solution is to provide that infrastructure and we maintain it. And so as you grow, if you're there for 20 years, we maintain it. And then as a result, it's a win-win for you because yes, you come in, but then it assures capital appreciation because one of the things you've seen in real estate in Africa is people rarely lose money on real estate. It's actually a viable business in the, if, you're, if you're in there for the long term. And so we assure capital appreciation for investors that come in. And we give development guidelines as to what exactly you need to develop. As a result, we are solving the problems and the challenges that currently exist in our urban cities where there's a lack of infrastructure, lack of zoning, and lack of management. We resolve that problem Thank in our projects. Thank you so much, Chenye. Thank you. Now, Ola, um, back to you. Uh, so, in terms of the kind of obstacles, so in terms of the obstacles you face, in, in funding projects. So the projects that you are able to look at and participate in, uh, when you have to deal with your investment committees or your credit committees, apologies, apologies your credit <laughs> committees, what, what, what are the issues you commonly come across when these, when these projects are put together? Okay, um, thank you very, very much. Um, I mean, I think it, it, it goes back to where, where we started from in saying for what purpose are those buildings being built, whether they are commercial properties, whether they are housing, um, residential housing properties, is whether, so the key thing is whether you're doing it for a build to let or a build to sell. So what is critical um, is the cash flow. You want to be certain that at the end of, of at the end of the day, a residential housing estate is able to sell. And what is the, what, what is the critical element there? I think Nana touched on it and, and Chinwe as well, and it goes to um, affordable housing. Um, um, you know, what, what is the price per unit? What is the affordability index of, of the end users? You know, the, the, the um, availability of, of mortgage products to, to help support. Um, what we've had historically is, is um, individuals um, take using their savings and building um, a mobile term. But I think when a jurisdiction or a jurisdiction where with the likes of projects that have been mentioned and with the right um, financing pro project, either via savings, loans, mortgage products, being able to match that, then you might see a greater off an uptake of of this project, so critical is cash flows and being able to to, um, to 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 liquidate those assets. Um, from a de developer side, what, what what is critical? Um, it's it's the track record. Um, being able to support, you know, because as a financial institution, Standard Bank, it's client centric. We believe in supporting our key um, clients in 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 in. in 
in their project in driving development of, of our own, which we call Af which we call Africa. So being able to find promoters, sponsors that have the financial strength, you know, because we've been in, in a period where there's been volatility, the liquidity issues, I've been able to find sponsors that are, are you know, critical to the projects that they fund, being able to back it in times of commodity or currency crisis, you know, it's, it's quite critical. Um, going back to the mortgage bid, um, you know, then being able to, to have a level of pre-let, you know, or pre-sale that, that, that begins to provide comfort. Um, at, the, at the end of the day, um, I, I think those are the, the, the metrics that we try to look at. Um, but working together with, um, with, um, with, our, with our partners, which, which are my very good friends here, <laughs> and ensuring that we're able to provide products and meet the end user consumers at the end of the day. Thank you very much, Tola. So, Mustafa, um, you've been operating in some markets that have experienced significant currency devaluation over the last couple of years and volatility. And as we have all touched on on this panel, there are few local production sources for high quality construction materials. So a significant portion of building material is imported. So how have you been able to manage this? You delivered a project in Nigeria recently under your PPP. So how did you deal with the exchange rate risk? Um, and how, what are the steps we, we can take to develop this manufacturing capacity locally? Well, good question. I mean, um, I, I differ a little bit from Nana. And um, uh, this argument can go on. Because whilst um, um, we all, you know, uh, want to see Africa develop if all these things happen, we can't wait. We need to supply material. And we must face the reality. If I want to develop a 1,000 homes, I mean, I look at where um, materials are most affordable and most competitive. So the ideal situation is if, yes, Africa is the next continent. We need to get all these things done. But the reality is that, look, wherever I find my materials most affordable, that's where I head to. Whether it's Mongolia or China or Brazil, I mean, that's where I will head to. So I'll just give an example how we were able to deliver about 1,000 homes within three years in Nigeria. And um, as I walked into this room, I looked at actually the, um, uh, the, the setting. And um, I think I'm convinced that the majority of people who are attending today are mostly suppliers, people who are here to look for business. And um, now I am talking from, a, from, from an experienced developer and, and what I look for from a supplier or somebody who's coming for my business. To start with, we headed out to China. I mean, I'll, I'll give you a very simple example. A thousand homes means that you need to buy an average of about ten thousand dollars. Practically in Africa, you cannot walk to a supplier and get ten thousand dollars delivered. You know, it, they will, there will already be, a, be an issue. So, just in short, as a developer, what I look for is a one-stop shop, and I was able to identify this in China. I had a supplier who will deal with about 15, 20 factories. But all I wanted was to walk into an office, have a deal with him, know what the price was. Obviously, I could negotiate because the bill was in the millions of dollars. But logistics was key, that my containers were shipped at the right time, you know, and quality will still remain the same. So we got about 850 containers, you know, supplied by one supplier. That is key. If you want to do anything like this, you need to zero down on logistics. Mm. So what, what we would look for from suppliers, consultants, whatever, is to give us the service of a one-stop shop. I would love to deal with somebody, maybe GBB, as he just mentioned. Uh, somebody who will be there to say, look, I will raise the finance for you. I will identify the suppliers and bring all this material to your doorstep. 
I mean, in Africa, if you want to deliver some of these projects, even the labor capacity is an issue. I mean, I had to move in, you know, about 400 Gambians and Senegalese from Senegal and Gambia all the way to Port Harcourt because, uh, let's face it, in Nigeria today, to get probably 100 good plumbers is a nightmare. That is the reality. We all know in West Africa that the best of tradesmen, they come from the Francophone. Mm -hmm. so, so these are major issues. Now, the key players in this market today are not in this hall. Somebody mentioned it. It's the Chinese. And what are the Chinese doing? And Chinese are exporting labor. So if you want to do some of these projects, you need to have the trained labor to do this. We also see the Indians doing the same thing. So this is one of the realities. And for us, the way that we were able to deliver our project, just to summarize, was one, to make sure that we identify a one-stop shop. Okay. Future projects that we are doing, I just mentioned that we, we've just signed up a PPP, building a special economic zone in the Gambia. Just for the consultants, we made sure that all the consultants came from South Africa. We're dealing with five consultants. So next week, I'm in Joburg, and I have a workshop with all my consultants. So I'm not dealing with one person from India, the other from China, probably they will have a language barrier, another guy from, from London or you know, from, from the Gambia. So I think this is key. If we were to deliver mass housing in Africa as there's the need, um, suppliers who are here now, the majority of them, needs to come up with solutions you know, for us as promoters. And the solution is to provide as much as possible a one-stop solution. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mustafa. So um, I think we have to round up very quickly, but before we go, I'm going to ask all of you for a key takeaway. So something for the audience uh, to, to take away from everything we've just been discussing so far. So I'll start with you, Tola. I think from my pers perspective, we, um, and from a financing background point of view, I, I, I would say that, um, that clearly that um, what is required within our continent, sub-Saharan Africa, is, is, um, is, is, is long-term, innovative, um, patient capital structures, um, which is required to then ex expand and sustain capital flows. Um, going to your first presentations, we've had a wave, what I, what I call the first wave over the last 10 years, where we've seen developments within um, the commercial real estate space, and now um, you're failing to greater developments within um, the housing space, but to be able to sustain that over the long term, so it's not, so, so it's not typically affected by the, the cycle that we see within um, real estate, it's important for sustainability to be there. Um, and that, that would then mean that there needs to be greater, a, a greater flow of, um, of domestic capital flows as well to back the off offshore capital flows that we've seen, typically from the South African market, but um, maybe trying to extend that beyond what we've seen and getting, getting more capital flows coming from the Middle East, from North, from North America, from, a from Asia. Um, Within our markets here, domestic capital could then come from pension funds, from insurance funds that have long-term capital and looking for, for long-term assets to, to, to ensure that maturity, that there's no maturity mismatch. Um, critical also is the need to have liquidity for, our, for the real estate assets that will come to play. So all this um, residential housing, looking for mortgage, um, for, for mortgage with, with as an instrument to create liquidity would also drive that capital flow. Those, I think those are the critical um, elements to ensure that we have a real estate market that is sustainable, that rewards all players, investors, developers, and the end, and the end um, users. Thank you very much. Thank you. Nana. Oh, thank you. Well, this is a great opportunity to be speaking to also the audience who are the suppliers in front of us. Uh, I believe that real estate is a business that you actually tailor it to suit a community in a part of the nation. You know, when we're talking about affordable, it falls within different regions, ranges. And so you cannot say that, okay, we're gonna do something for middle income and not below middle or up mid or this. There are different ranges about it, but I just 
I have been a victim of buying from Europe, from China, from everywhere in the world. And I think it's been a great time doing business because even so, using that solution has still brought us to success. But um, just to pick something from what Mustafa said, he said that I got 850 containers. That is about five vessels together. That logistic cost is a lot. I want to be able to bid it down so we save this time and save this money. My ambition is to partner with all of you as already you are my partners. I've been buying from you from Europe. But my ambition is really to bring you here because I would rather have the 850 containers leaving my country to other countries or other country in Africa into other countries since we know that we're developing Africa the most. So the relationship that we're here to build today is not only partnership to purchase from you guys from outside, but it's also partnership to make sure that you become our partners in our African countries as well. So we don't have to ship 850 containers to do 1,000 homes. Those numbers are quite difficult. Yes, it might work. They might have executed the project, but let's think about the success of the project and the longevity of the project. It might not last for 10 years. See, I have a good friend who built 4,000 homes in Ghana. When he was building these homes, he was very proud of what he was doing. He studied uh, about the polystyrene block. So this is something that a technology that he brought from outside and brought a plant into Ghana and built the 4,000 homes. When he was building the homes, he hadn't done his acquisition properly, but he had the government support. He finished building the um, 4,000 homes and realized that the people who are going to live in those homes have to travel 22 kilometers to Tema, that is the closest city, to go to work and come back another 22 kilometers. So it makes it 44 kilometers a day for someone that you have built an affordable homes for. He has to travel 44 kilometers a day to go to work in and out. When you do the numbers, for the traveling cost alone, in eight years, it's more than the house you've sold to him. You haven't done this guy any favor. Even though you're trying to house him, you're still putting him through stress. There has been a lot of government projects, low-income projects, affordable homes, which has been a great failure in Africa. And we should know that. We should learn from that mistakes, that our governments, our private sectors, our developers have had made some mistakes in these affordable homes and even development on different skills, whether it's up, mid, or low. We have had a lot of failures, and I want us, we, the Africans, who are very interested in developing our country as developers, as financiers, as contractors, as CEOs, I want us to put these things into consideration that the people of the world need to support us on our grounds. They need to be part of us. A lot of things happen in this country where it's been a structure that could build a million affordable homes for us, but we never know about it. But for the first time, I'm urging the world, I'm urging people to be part of this Africa revolution. It's a new revolution, a new development, a new nation, a new face, new people that I believe that strongly all these people here should be a part of this. Thank, thank you, you very so much. much. Thank you. Thank you. I won't sit next to Nana next time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, in terms of what I have taken as a lesson learned and key takeaway, a couple of things that kind of piggybacks on the comments so far. For me, it's to recognize the opportunities within the challenges that exist. So piggybacking on what Nana has talked about, actually, I will echo a similar sentiment. So for the project that we currently have at the Lakey Free Trade Zone, we are incorporating a very similar strategy, encouraging suppliers to come in and take advantage of the free trade zone benefits by establishing their facility at the free trade zone with the caveat that the immediate opportunities are not just for endeavor in terms of we're building a home, we're building a project the size of Victoria Island, even bigger than Victoria Island. It's the Dangotes, it's the Chinese. The entire free trade zone is 16,500 hectares. Mm -hmm. And hence, it's here to stay for the next 20 years. So by being plugged in, 
You're, being, you're coming in as a partner. You're not just coming in as a supplier, but come in, establish yourself, be a partner, and then see yourselves gain access, immediate access to development and to other clients and other potential over the next 15, 20 years. So I echo that. I'm also gonna echo what Mustafa is talking about in terms of affordable housing, but take it a step further. I think my lessons learned from what Mustafa, what Mustafa has said as well as what Nana talked about is the fact that we need to be a lot more strategic in the solutions that we're providing. It's not just we're coming in affordable housing. You need to consider logistics. You need to understand where's the urbanization corridor. You need to understand where are these people going to be living, where they're going to be working. And hence, when you're coming up with a solution, understand and bring all the stakeholders involved in determining a solution. So for instance, one of the Rendeva projects we have is in Apollonia. And Apollonia actually has created an affordable housing project in partnership with Ghana Home Loans. Mm -hmm. But it's a very structured solution. 2,000 homes with Ghana Home Loans because Ghana Home Loans actually has uptakers. Mm -hmm. And hence, the entire value chain is connected. Mm -hmm. It's not a situation where you build and you hope they come or you hope they come and then you build. It's actually coming up with a solution. Now, that may not be, I don't recommend a cookie cutter approach for all African countries, but it's rest, again, recognizing the challenges for what they are, with each country presenting its own set of unique challenges, and then determining a solution, which is the opportunity that you can deliver. Thank you very much, Chinue. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chinue. So you, since you borrowed from me, I'm also borrowed back from you. <laughs> well, I, I would like to summarize and um, uh, identify, I mean, the biggest opportunity that, that you know, one needs to identify in housing delivery is not building the houses actually itself. It's the off-take. You know, you need to get the off-take right. So um, I, I agree with you 100%. And um, I think there are so many um, initiatives being taken you know, uh, to make um, the off-take you know, affordable, where mortgages, obviously, you can't buy a house without getting the right mortgage. But my, my, my um, 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 takeaway from this um, uh, is to say that from Tough Africa Global, we've said our vision already, which is to develop a million homes, which is a lot. Um, we are local partners. We understand the ground, registered in eight African countries, with dominance, obviously, in Nigeria and the Gambia. And we're here as a local partner. We're a local partner. We understand the ground very well. We can do things that most of our foreign partners can't do. So if you're looking for partnership, whether it's finance, your services, supplies, I mean, we are partners that you can deal with. We understand the ground very well. We have a very clear vision. We have a long term, um, we have a long experience in this, and we've done it before. So we are looking for partners that will work with us to develop this huge vision of a million homes over the next 20 years, and we will mutually make money, whoever our partners are. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Okay, um, I, yeah, we'll take a couple of questions from the audience. So, um, are there any from the floor? Okay. Oh. Okay. Um, hi, good morning. Um, I, I just want to ask a, a, a few questions or just put up uh, what I thought or took from what you, you said. Uh, especially to Nana, Chinue, and Mr. Mustafa. Um, regarding Nana, um, I understand that you are developing a city and then um, uh, going on as far as the outskirts of Accra. Um, from the challenges that you are facing, um, I just want to ask from you, because there's a lack of infrastructure, what I have noticed in here in Ghana is that there's a lot of um, private people doing a lot of things, which is good for the nation. But at the end of the day, we realize that because there's this lack of, um, let's say, regulation um, format in terms of how to build, construct streets, uh, like Nana was saying, waste management, 
um, in the PCC, you realize that a lot of people are doing things without um, proper planning. Um, let's say, Nana, you have a certification book that you're going by, but it is not a national certification. So you realize that whatever you are doing will be different from another person. So whenever I also want to do a, a city close by yours, the conformity will not be, will not match. So I wanted to know how, um, how you're going about that in terms of this, uh, because you, you realize that when you are driving through, let's say, Pasua, you realize that people build, even their fence walls are in, into the street. There's no pavement, there's no drains. And if you are saying that you're developing a, um, um, Africa, these are the things that we need to look at. I also look at... Um, uh, it's, it's, I'm so sorry to interrupt. I think we, we can take one question from you, yeah. Nana, and then we, we will move on to other people, please. Right. Thank you. Great question anyway, but it was a very long one. So, um, first of all, to build a city, you need to find out about the entire community, what they have in resources, in minerals, and commodities. That's what determines the need of that development in that area. So when you're looking at Western region, Western region actually, based on our research before we even went into, into buying and doing acquisition, Western region of Ghana is by far one of the richest continent, uh, regions on this continent we live on. It's the only region that has almost 10 minerals, uh, commodities, and resources together concentrated in one area. See, the government might not look at it from that perspective, but we, the investors and developers, when we see that there is oil, there is cocoa, there is gold, there is rubber, there is palm this, there is that, there is that, and there is no city. That is the hub of West Africa. That is, what, that is the vision that we need to see, that people who develop homes and develop communities and countries are visionaries that have been gifted with the wisdom just to do that. So for us, when we realize the opportunity of Takrade and what it's in Takrade and Western region in those areas, the connection goes to Kumase, it goes to Ivory Coast, it connects you to Liberia, it connects you to other places, and guess what? It's sitting right next to the coast. It's a great opportunity when we see these things by vision, we should try and find any means necessary to transform this vision into reality. Because people are going to benefit from these minerals and these resources that we're talking about. And I'll give you a very good example. If one plant that we intend to put in Takrade, which is the petroleum free zone, if one plant that we are going to turn from cocoa into Cadbury chocolate, that is three jobs in one plant. Is the guy that processes the cocoa, is the guy that manufactures the cocoa, and is the other guy that packages it. So you're creating three jobs in one plant. That could be times 3,000. That makes it 9,000. Now you can build 2,000 homes because those 9,000 people have a steady job that is consistent to be able to pay for those homes. So this is the trick. The trick is not us trying to build affordable homes because our people need it. The trick is that the affordable homes needs to match the employment that we're lacking. The people that doesn't have jobs. Because if they don't have jobs, then why are you building for them? How are they going to pay? And so these are some of the things and the reasons why we go for certain areas in particular and say, this is where we're going to do this development. This is where I'm going to build number one. This is where we're going to build city. After all, Real estate has three rules, and the rule number one is location, and rule number two is location, rule number three is location. So just choose it right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Can, can you give this? Oh. Hello. Okay. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Vikas. Um, I'm from Noble Carpets. We are a manufacturer of uh, carpets and floors in Nigeria. I would like to ask a question to Mr. Nana and Mr. Ura that uh, what is your take for uh, local content? Like you said that, okay, you would like to partner with people who will come and manufacture in West Africa. What about people who are already doing so? And what support can be given so that they can be brought on board? Because we face challenges. 
the local content as specification is missing plus this false perception that okay it is made in nigeria or made in africa it's substandard or it is european is better so i would like to know what is your answer thank you If you ask the question to me, I'm okay. Okay, okay, okay. You can ask. Yeah, um, I, I, I think these are these are these are actually uh, questions that could have been answered by by government officials because this is a policy issue. Um, I, if I understand your question very well, um, you are a manufacturer of carpets in Nigeria, and um, uh, and you're asking about lo local content. Um, is it competing with international? I think, we, honestly, we have a very long way to go because, um, again, government must enforce, you know, if there are policies on local content for this to happen. But um, uh, as things are, for now, across Africa, I mean, I think it's uh, free for all. Anybody can buy from anywhere where it's most competitive. You know, that, that's, that's the reality. Um, uh, but if, if probably looking ahead, I mean, we, we hear about the, the Africa Free Trade um, Agreement that's coming up. Um, uh, if this happens, I mean, anybody with local content, you know, will, 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 will have an advantage. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, just to add a little bit more to your, uh, your, your answer for the question. T today, one of the things that I see in Ghana is that I see Chinese in our markets selling as well. The same Chinese we go to them to buy from, now they've come to us and they're selling. They have shops, they have tables. What I see from that is that if we don't partner with them to be part of the same manufacturers and the things that we're going out there to get from them, they're obviously going to find their own way into the market. And so if, let's say my friend here is a manufacturer of carpet in, in, in Nigeria and maybe they're a little bit worried about competitors who are going to be the local content or come from the local content. It's just for me about them making sure that they have streamlined their product, connecting themselves to the right people who need that product, who need that carpet. I mean, the question is, are we putting carpets in low income or mid income or what is the value or what is the quality that you're producing in the market that suits the national demand. And I always think that competition is healthy. I would like to see six, seven carpet manufacturers at the same time so I can have a choice in buying. It's the same thing in Europe, it's the same thing in China, it's the same thing everywhere, and I think it's very healthy to have that. Thank you. Okay. One more question. Good morning. Oh, my name is Jose Fernandez. I'm working for SMEC and Survana Durong. And thank you for for the opportunity to speak about what the success of Singapore, and we worked already in that project. But I want to make a question about, in Africa, in your experience, how does the government help you on the, the planning of the process? Because master planning is a key, uh, is a key factor of the success of your project. And of course, you can't do it alone. You must. You have the rules from the government, you have the, uh, the, the, the vision that the, the government has for the region. And if you do a project in one side without any road, you can't do it, as you mentioned. So the question is, I want to know how you deal with the government, which should have the correct rules and planning vision for your project. And uh, one more question, how do you control, and this is for Mustafa, how do you control the quality of the, in the, in the case of one, one shop, one stop shop, as you mentioned, how do you control the quality in, the, in a case like this, for example, from the Chinese suppliers? Our experience is not very good. And I would like you to know about a little bit from your experience. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I mean, first of all, uh, talking about a company like Subaru Jerome, it's, um, these are people who um, they put the visibility and the planning of industrialization together. They have been quite successful in other countries. They came from Singapore. We actually 
uh, identify them. We found them, that there are teams who are specialized on assisting countries to build their industrial platforms because it's needed. And as the question that you asked, that how do we sometimes find our ways to overcome some of these planning regulations from the government? It's a big issue in Africa. First of all, like I talked about acquisition. Secondly, you might have the land, but what you want to build on it now is a problem. You know, and um, sometimes you need to go around these regulations and help to get some of these laws affected so you can actually tailor your development to those new laws that has been affected through the town planning. Building is such a creative aspect that you need to be involved with a lot of different organizations and entities from the government sector, from the creative sector, from the actual street level sector, you need to see the mindset of these people, what they want before you start to even think of the building that you're gonna build for them, before you sit with a bank, before you sit with other people. You need to be able to do this. And Africa is beginning to open up. So our municipalities and all these entities are also willing to compromise. Back then, we didn't think that Airport City Mall would just come up. This plan had been planned for 27 years ago. It never happened, but it was planned by the government. The minute that they merged with the private sector, within six years, psh, it's up. So there is a need of mergence, of the government merging with the private sector, and also respecting our drive our vision and our ability to develop, to support what we want to do. Because even though Airport City is such a successful development, one night I was driving on it and I started to laugh at my own country's town planning that why would you have single roads for 10,000 inhabitants? And it's next to the airport. And one day, if 1% of the country decides to travel, this whole place can be choked for three days. So we already have infrastructure problems, but it is always a drive. Once the development is done, infrastructure is forced to be incorporated with it, is needed. Like we can see in Dubai, almost every one week, two weeks, they start a flyover. You know, because the demand of people going to Dubai today and living there, whether they're spending a week, a day, a month, or a year, is high. So you're forced to expand the infrastructure based on the level and the growth of development. The pace needs to be quick. And hence, that's my point of efficiency. Efficiency is the next biggest thing in our development. If we can do it quick, even though the municipalities have some sort of conditions and regulations and laws that would give us setbacks, it's always good to sit with them and negotiate with them because after all, you're their client. You're paying for a tax you're paying for a certificate. You're paying for a permit. You know, so you are clients to the government. And if you have that power, you should be able to sit down with them and negotiate with them, compromise with them, and still go ahead and do the development that is suitable for the national demand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just real quick. Um, I think the way we've done it for the Licky project is the government did have a master plan. And again, it's a matter of just timeline. Because we were more patient, the government put together a master plan, we worked with them and got the master plan. The zone that we currently work in is zoned for mixed use. And so we intentionally selected that. So the Dangote, the Chinese, are more of the heavy industrial. We have light industrial and mixed use. Once we got that, then we took on and built an additional master plan working with um, SOM, Skidmore, Owens, and Maryland to actually put together a more detailed master plan that incorporated best-in-class standards and incorporated these challenges of foreseeing the growth of urbanization and ensuring that you can adhere accordingly as urbanization comes in. So that's how it's, it actually has worked out. Thank you. I mean, to answer your question, I mean, it's a very difficult one. Uh, but I, I, I did mention it um, uh, um, in my uh, first intervention. The answer, I think, is in Africa is to get a good local partner. Um, I'm Gambian, registered in seven other countries. But w rule number one is that we always, find, we always have good local partners. 
if we establish our companies, we only take 51%. 49% must be very good, credible, well-connected local partners. Because continuity in Africa is a big issue. It can even change within a government. You can have a minister that has been changed who comes in and just packs up everything that his predecessor was doing and comes with his own idea. idea. But again, hey, today we don't only blame Africans. If we see what's happening in the advanced world with the president of the USA, with you know, some treaties that have been signed for a long time. So, so maybe it's more political. Political continuity is always a major challenge to, to, to um, uh, business. Your second question um, uh, is more about um, quantity, uh, quality control. And that is why we go for a one-stop shop. Remember, we're dealing with one client who's looking for continuity in our business. So they are the ones who co control the quality. They are dealing with all the suppliers, control all the co quality, and then supplies us. So we don't, we don't actually know the supplier of our doors, but we know the quality, we, the quality and the standards of our materials. And we are being supplied by one supplier. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, so uh, I think we've overrun significantly, um, but I'm sure you all enjoyed that. So I'd like to say a big thank you to our panelists again for participating and providing great insights into this market. And thanks to you. Pay. The U.S., when they borrow money, they're getting it in 1.5, 1.9 interest rate. Africans, when they get the same amount of money, they're paying 9, 10%. The people who don't need a break, they get a break. The ones who need a break, they don't get a break. The sheer survival of the World Bank IMF is based on the fact that African countries and, and many other developing countries do not succeed. Their success is based on our failure. That has to change. And guess who can make that change? We, the children of Africa, we, the Africans, are the ones who have to say, we know your game now. Enough is enough. We're not playing it anymore. And this is where the diaspora come in. There are more Ghanaian doctors in New York City than in, in the entire country of Ghana. There are more doc Nigerian doctors in LA than in the entire country of Nigeria. So let's be serious here. What Africa needs is capacity, capacity, capacity. And that capacity is in the diaspora. So it behooves us to bring the diaspora together. Let them understand what is really going on in our Africa. Diaspora are not going home. Diaspora are angry about Africa because they are not understanding the root cause of why Africa is where it is today. They think getting rid of a president will take care of the problem. Far from it. That president is just going to be replaced by another one who is going to equally suffer from the same difficult environment to work in. So let's look at an Africa that must be free to take care of herself, an Africa that's free from exploitation from outsiders. The multinationals who are stealing from Africa every day in broad daylight. I use an example of the DRC. If you ever fly very low over the DRC, you'll see tarmacs in the jungle. You'll see 747s flying into DRC, picking up minerals and flying right out. The same multinationals are responsible for arming young people and giving them MK-16s. Because why? Their satellites in the skies are telling them where that village is. There's, there are lots of diamonds. So what do they do? Arm young people, drag them up, and send them to go chop off a few heads. The rest of the village runs away, so they come behind and do their illegal mining. We black people must understand what is really going on. Because what we are shown instead is, oh, look at those Africans killing each other. There are some serious games that have been played in Africa for far too long. And once we understand that, we can strategize as to how we can begin to bring the difference and bring the change that Africa needs. And that change can only come if the African diaspora are united and the Wakanda villages, as I call them. It is our organized way of saying, starting with one African diaspora center of excellence, it will be a new city, a developmental hub that we can then take from there Every sector is developed. Take healthcare. How many doctors do we need in this region to take care of this many people? We pick up education, same thing. We pick up engineering. We pick up electricity. How many megawatts of power do we have in the region? How many do we need? Be it solar, be it wind, be it hydro, be it geothermal, be it nuclear.